Okay, now we're preparing to live stream. Sorry, folks. I'm clicking got it again. Everything's fine. Yes, should I click got it again, Sarah? All right, and we're live if you'd like to go ahead and start the introduction, okay. Sandy. Now we're preparing to live stream. Sorry, <laughs> folks. I'm clicking got it again. Hello, everyone. Yes, should I click got it again, Sarah? All right, and we're live. Just if go with the like introduction, my dear. And start the okay, well, Sarah, we're what's going on? <sighs> okay, I'm new. Okay. Uh, all right, let me get back to here. Oh hey, yo, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to our lecture on Guatemala. Uh, Dr. Uh, and presenting will be Dr. Bruno Walton uh, Donald. Uh, he is a professor of political science at FSW. Uh, he teaches international relations, terrorism, and political violence, comparative politics, and American government. Uh, he, he, he holds a doctorate and master's degree in political science from Washington State University and a bachelor's degree in government from East, Eastern Washington University. His academic research centers on political psychology with a focus on insurgencies. He has uh, conducted field research uh, in Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Iraq. Uh, his publications include co-authorship of a book titled quote, the role of female combatants in the Nicaraguan revolution and counter-revolutionary war, published in 2019 by uh, Rutledge Press, a book entitled, quote, Com uh, Confronting Al-Qaeda, okay, the Sunni Awakening and American Strategy in Al-Ambar, unquote, uh, published 2016 by Roman and Littlefield, a chapter in, quote, trends in policing interviews with police leaders across the globe, unquote, a book uh, edited by uh, Owen uh, Miriam, uh, a chapter in Israeli-Palestinian conflict, war coverage, and peace journalism, a book edited by Wilhelm Kemp, uh, as well as journal articles appearing in conflict and communication and in Latin American policy. So please let us welcome uh, Dr. Bruno Boltadano. Thank you, Sandy, uh, for um, your introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. So today we will be uh, talking um, and, and discussing, uh, as the format allows us, um, uh, about the Guatemalan genocide uh, or what is uh, commonly known as the silent genocide. And, and why is it called the silent genocide? And, and the answer is, is relatively um, simple but distressing at the time in, in that there were a number of different uh, mechanisms, political and, and, and otherwise, that at the time uh, of, the, of the ongoing violence uh, prevented uh, the world community and uh, even uh, to some degree, the larger uh, population in Guatemala from um, understanding the true events of, of the violence, the, the, the reality of the genocide. Uh, and, and as we have been um, highlighting in, in, in this whole, 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 whole week, which is, is uh, an, a number of, of years, uh, at least uh, uh, more than a decade of FSW's um, focus on the Holocaust Memorial. Um, this is an important consideration, right? Uh, why is it that uh, this extreme form of violence continues to occur in light of the, the reality that the world community um, signed a, a document that we refer to as the Genocide Convention uh, in which uh, signatory countries, and by extension, the people of the world agreed that uh, never again we, we would see the, the level of devastation that um, was experienced during the Holocaust in, uh, in, in, in Europe during World War II. But yet again, here we are. We, we talk about uh, ongoing genocides at this time. And, and so that renders a question, why do we continue to see this extreme form of violence 
even as we, uh, as a community or nation, uh, promised that we would do whatever it takes to stop it. Uh, in, in our this conversation, this uh, this talk will highlight uh, uh, a unique case. Uh, the focus of, of this Holocaust week is uh, on the liber liberators, but in, in the case of, of Guatemala, um, there, there were none. Uh, it, it, it didn't happen in the way that um, it occurred in, in uh, during the Holocaust in Europe. And, and part of the question is why, why not? So that's one of the things we will um, uh, accomplish or, or try to accomplish in this, uh, in this talk that we have today. So let me start sharing the, the PowerPoint, uh, my screen as I have it here, if uh, give me a moment to do this. So the title of this talk is Denial in the Absence of uh, Liberators in the Guatemalan Genocide. This is a picture of uh, indigenous um, Mayan people uh, who, mostly women, as you can see, uh, who were um, uh, protesting uh, in, in, in a silent way about the, the loss of, of people, their family members during the genocide. And I'd like to start, um, uh, start us today by taking a um, sort of a, you know, maybe a, a silly exercise, but it's, it's really uh, um, not silly in many different ways. Looking at a couple of drawings. This is a drawing that one of my young, my youngest daughter did many years ago when she came to work one time. She was, I was doing work on my desk and she was doodling. And, and it's a type of drawing that a child uh, at the time she was, uh, I think nine or so, uh, should be doing, looks happy, happy colors, right? Um, and then um, I like us to contrast this with this other drawing of a child around the same age. This is a uh, one of many drawings that were collected in um, Los Angeles for uh, a museum exhibit. That these were drawings that, like my daughter's drawing, were sort of spontaneous. Uh, these were children who were uh, war refugees from Guatemala that uh, trying to have a daily life, a normal life in, 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 as they were political, already political refugees in the United States were giving a piece of paper and coloring. And this is what they drew. Uh, this is what uh, it was in their mind. And as you can see, this is a representation of, of um, one of the many different events of the genocide. This is a, a village in which the, 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 the military came you know, a person in, in green military gear. There's an, uh, a helicopter that's not dropping water. Those are bullets. Um, and what the child, this child wrote um, is war. You can see the, 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 the word itself in Spanish. And towards the bottom left of that one drawing is it says that this is the way our families um, were killed. And, and I, I, I like this just a position because it, it, and again, one of the, the consequences of, of, of all political violence, truly extreme forms of violence, is the impact that it has um, across generations. And, and you know, it, I, it gives me pause, of, of course, and I, and I wondered um, what you all think about this. Maybe you can make some comments uh, in, in, in terms of the two different uh, uh, children uh, about the same age uh, representing the world in vastly different ways. So as, uh, as I mentioned in uh, our talk, well, obviously all of our talks uh, consider the reality that genocide is the type of situation, the type of extreme form of violence that is difficult for, under for us to understand. Um, that creates uh, a difficulty in our own individual psyche and as a community and as, as, as a human race um, that we're puzzled. How is it that people can do this to one another, right? And, and I wrote a couple of, a number of questions along this line. What, what is it like to en endure this type of violence, right? And, and I think to some degree, 
we can get a sense of it through that child's drawing that I showed you just a moment ago. And, and then uh, also along the same lines, what is it that happens to people that, that um, uh, live through and survive uh, a genocide? And we have been blessed uh, uh, at FSW and, and the Holocaust Memorial uh, events over the years to have the, gen, uh, the, um, the, the kindness of Holocaust survivors to tell their stories. I know we have at least one more left later this afternoon. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, at 6 p.m., we have another one, the, the last remaining in, of this year's survivor talks. And I, I encourage you to, 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 visit, to, to listen to, to this one talk um, because it's a unique opportunity. And as I mentioned earlier, part of the question really is, why is it that this type of violence continues to come up again, again, again in human, uh, in human history? Uh, and as I mentioned, this particular narrative, this particular uh, rather presentation will address how the way in which the genocide in Guatemala was presented, uh, the, the stories that were crafted around it created a form of silencing uh, of the event and, and of the violence itself. And what's unique about this, this case study, the, the Guatemalan genocide, it, it, that it illustrates not only the negative impact of, of the violence itself, the, the, the dreadful consequences of, of denial, uh, but it also allows us to see um, how we understand the event many years later. One of the things that's unique about this Guatemalan genocide, it was that uh, through the work of an, in, uh, a couple of non-government organizations and the government of Guatemala and the government of Spain, some of the perpetrators were eventually brought to justice. It all began with um, the work of the uh, Commission for the Historical Clarification of the Genocide in Guatemala that did gather a lot of evidence. And, and their finding was uh, very clear. There, there, there was no question that it was genocide and they called it so. So after, and that was in 1999. Uh, the genocide occurred between the 19, late 50s to 19, uh, well into the early 1990s. Um, and so after, you know, beginning in the 20th, 21st century, more and more people in Guatemala were willing to call it for what it was, a genocide. And so our understanding of this particular case changed uh, after uh, the, the investigation. And nonetheless, um, within the same country that began to speak more openly about uh, violence that they called a genocide and that it was a genocide, um, the government and some of the more powerful groups in Guatemala continued to uh, either deny that it occurred or make the argument that if it did occur, it's harmful to the nation in and of itself to talk about it, that it will prevent economic and political development and maybe we should leave it behind sort of thing. And one of the central points that I wanna make in, 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 in our time today is that the denial uh, of, of, the, uh, of the genocide continues to justify violence uh, against indigenous people. Let me switch for a moment um, and uh, continue to share my screen, but I wanted for the sake of um, providing a, a better historical uh, understanding of this than I can um, to play this four minute and a half or so video. Uh, this is uh, a video that's put together by uh, an organization from the University of Southern California called the Shoah uh, Institution, which is an organization that is, is, is built specifically to record and provide evidence of genocide around the world. Um, the idea of this institution was, um, was born uh, from Steven Spielberg, who um, has uh, some family connections and also he has been involved in, in attempting to create a record. So let's let's take a moment and, and watch this. Approximately 200,000 Guatemalan civilians were murdered in the Guatemalan Civil War, which peaked between 1980 and 1983 with the Guatemalan Genocide. 
The vast majority of those killed in the genocide were indigenous, meaning native, people of Mayan descent. But to understand the nature of the Guatemalan genocide, we first need to learn how it began. When Guatemala was a Spanish colony, foreigners who considered Mayans inferior and culturally backward imposed racial divisions that made them second-class citizens. At the time, indigenous Mayans made up over two-thirds of the country's population. But even after Guatemala became an independent state in 1847, the racist class divisions remained. Mayans were oppressed by foreigners and non-indigenous Guatemalans who evicted the Mayans from their rural homelands in order to build coffee and banana plantations. In 1952, President Jacobo Arbenz attempted to stop the exploitation of Mayans by passing an agricultural reform law. But two years later, the wealthy plantation owners responded with a coup d'etat that overthrew Arbenz from the presidency. This coup was supported by United States President Dwight Eisenhower, who feared that the changes that events was bringing would turn Guatemala into a communist state. Eisenhower authorized the CIA to arm, fund, and train the invasion force that unseated Arbenz. In the decades that followed, Guatemala was ruled by a series of military dictators. These dictators walked back Arbenz's changes, continuing the oppression of the Mayans while benefiting plantation owners and large corporations. They were consistently supported by the United States, which continued to believe it was helping fight communism through its efforts. In 1960, a military rebellion unsuccessfully attempted to overthrow the current presidency. Following their failure, a guerrilla rebel organization was created, the Rebel Armed Forces, or FARC. With the forming of FARC, the Guatemalan Civil War began. It would not end until 1996. The government responded with forced disappearances, a term for secret imprisonments or murders of Guatemalans who protested or opposed their dictators. In response, the guerrilla rebel army grew and new social movements were formed. In 1980, to attempt to stop the growing rebellion, then President Romeo Lucas Garcia initiated a counterinsurgency campaign, which many considered the beginning of the Guatemalan genocide. Because the opposition to the dictatorship was growing in rural Mayan lands, Mayans were declared internal enemies of the state. Civilians were systematically massacred. Mayans who survived were kept in camps called model villages, where they were held captive by the military. Many Mayans, as young as 14, were even forced to form patrols and participate in the violence alongside the perpetrators. But the situation continued to worsen from there. In 1982, General Efrain Rios Montt overthrew Lucas Garcia to become the new dictator president of Guatemala. Under his rule, approximately 111 people were slaughtered every day, almost all Mayans. Indiscriminate massacres, tortures, and forced displacements were sanctioned by the military. More than 100,000 women were raped, over 400 villages were burned to the ground. Some Mayans hid in the mountains where they were targeted in military bombing campaigns. Many hid in Guatemala's forests, forming communities that hid together for years. Others escaped to Mexico for refuge. Meanwhile, in 1982 and 1983, U.S. President Ronald Reagan sent money, munitions, and training to the Guatemalan army. While the Guatemalan genocide was being perpetrated, the United States provided the murderers with supplies. While some argue that the genocide ended in 1983 with a coup that overthrew Rios Montt, the mass killings continued until 1984. That year, due to international pressure, Guatemala began. So, um, I just received a message that the video wasn't playing, and I'm sorry about that. I don't know why that is the case. Um, and we can just go back uh, and continue uh, our work. I will put the link real quick um, in the chat option. Maybe that will allow us to, to, to continue to have that access. And I do apologize. Of course, I didn't know that it wasn't showing. Um, so I just shared it on... Um, on the chat on Zoom, and and uh, hopefully Zara can 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 um, provide that to you all. So let's continue for for a moment without that. And I do apologize if it was just a moment of silence. I don't uh, I wasn't aware of that. So um, what?
part of um, what will be useful to um, to us to, to recognize is that uh, there is significant data that leaves no question about what happens. Uh, and this is, um, you know, these numbers uh, come from the Center of Justice and Equal and Accountability uh, in Guatemala that track down uh, the, the level of the violence. So uh, about 200,000 Guatemalans were, were killed in this genocide. It was a deliberate attempt uh, to, to uh, uh, targeting uh, the indigenous Mayans. And uh, half a million went into exile, one million became internally displaced. And if you can think about it in a population of 6 million, that's uh, about one third of the population impacted, significant, right? And the majority of them were uh, indigenous Mayans and the, the majority of the atrocities were conducted by the, uh, the, the Guatemalan forces. As the video, hopefully some of you caught, um, uh, you, you all caught some of the video, it makes it pretty clear, um, the video, that the United States was complicit in, in, in the violence and in the rise towards genocide, which is one of the questions for us to consider, not just because this is a presentation that's made in the United States, but also because in general, what are the consequences? What were the consequences of the United States involvement in um, protecting the perpetrators and in also providing the tools for genocide, right? As part of the video uh, mentioned, this, this whole conflict was understood from the perspective of the United States and of the Guatemalan military and of the Guatemalan government as a, by, uh, as a proxy war between uh, the United States and, and communism. So the, the conflict became itself uh, politicized. I have a number of, um, of, of things to highlight uh, that as, uh, Hopefully this shows up uh, as I hope that it will. Uh, one of the things that's unique about uh, the, and anybody that's interested in, in the Guatemalan genocide is that um, in, in the early 21st century, uh, a vast amount of data uh, of, of internal documents between the CIA, the uh, Guatemalan uh, embassy, and the White House throughout a number of different administrations was were declassified. And I, I picked a few out of a vast amount of, of, of data. This is um, dated 1997. Uh, and at the time it was under the Clinton administration if I, um, um, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. What this does is this document, which is now again now declassified um, makes it pretty clear uh, uh, that we were, we were aware of the violence. It, it lists the number of people in, in case one, case two, case 40, so forth and so on, case five. And, and um, so, but nonetheless, we continued to, um, to provide uh, support for the perpetrators. Um, this is an, an older document. Uh, this is from 1951. That again is declassified after it was. Uh, I like the word uh, that they use the word sanitized, um, and uh, this makes it pretty clear that um, that the CIA was uh, directly involved uh, with not only the government of, of of Guatemala and the military of Guatemala, but also the. Uh, uh, American companies like the United Fruit Company and the Electric Company, Bond and Share Company, uh, both American companies that worked together with the CIA to uh, carry out a violent coup d'etat or removal of uh, a democratically elected president in a foreign country. So you can begin to see that this sort of involvement of American interest in the violence in Guatemala was not limited only to the US government, but also to economic um, uh, interest. And, and let's see, this is a, a different one. Uh, I think you Excuse saw- me, Dr. Yes. I'm sorry. We're still just seeing your PowerPoint. I know that you wanted to show us those documents. Can you slide the doc, I know. Can you slide the documents over perhaps in front of your PowerPoint? I know we wanna see those. Yeah, can I do, what happens if I, 
if I uh, if I do this, can I? Uh, let's see. Can you see there it you. now? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, so just to be sure, you didn't see any other other documents that I was talking about, right? No, this is the first one. Okay, we'll we'll come back to them. Yes. So this is this is a document from 1975 that. Uh, Again, was sanitized or or, or uh, declassified in two thousand and three. That highlights uh, the the direct involvement of the of, of the CIA in in Guatemala in conjunction, in this case, with uh, another Central American country, the country of Nicaragua. So it was a, a, an involved um, uh, e and complex phenomenon. As I mentioned, I'll, I'll bring up just now also the the document. Uh, the declassified document that lists the involvement of uh, American companies. But here you see uh, a very detailed, uh, no longer secret, uh, significant planning. Um, let's see, I think is this one. Yeah, this is from 1951. Um, again, declassified. And what you see here is uh, the United Fruit Company and an electrical company comp called, called Electric Bond and, and, and Share that said to the CIA, hey, you can use our facilities and you can use our personnel uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the attempt as you were getting, getting ready to, uh, to overthrow a democratic government through violence, through a coup d'etat. And this is an earlier document that I had talked about that um, this is from 1997 that lists a number of uh, events with some detail in terms of even some cases names that leaves it no no leaves no question to to the reality that the United States was aware about the level of violence um, uh, to to the degree that there was uh, communication between um, Guatemala uh, uh, the embassy and and uh, um, and the CIA uh, in the White House in terms of uh, uh, the nature of the, the massacres and nature of the violence, right? And this is another interesting document to consider as we look at, at that incident, at that genocide, and we consider what were the impacts of the American involvement in denying and creating a, a, a culture of denial around it. This is from 1953. And what this document says is that um, the U.S. Uh, 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 delegation, uh, diplomatic delegation in, um, in Guatemala will work to, to create a, a, a sanitized, a cleaned narrative about the violence. Um, and and to, to the degree that um, you know, we will provide information to, to the media as to uh, how the it shouldn't be the government that is to be blamed, but the uh, the uh, anti-government forces that were labeled as um, uh, as communist. And, and so, what you see clearly here is an attempt to, again, an attempt to promote articles uh, that created a, a a different narrative than the reality uh, on the ground, um, which. Uh, and then this is an, uh, yet another, uh, I, I promise I'm not gonna do this for an hour. I just picked a few that, that, are, um, that, that were descriptive about the involvement of the, the United States, which again, I mentioned was not just the government, but also even corporations and it involved other countries in the region like Nicaragua and Honduras. Um, this is what this says is a, you know a list of, of people who are uh, are going to be disposed of and, and I'm sure everybody can um, can can understand what that means uh, and and the, the the consideration is well this is who they want to be disposed what are we going to do about it right um, so and and it, that least again no no question um, let's see. Uh, as to what um, the involvement of the United States. Well, this is another one that I titled Troublesome Stories uh, that uh, again is, there was a human rights report uh, in, 
1982, this is under, an, uh, under the Reagan administration, that um, uh, Amnesty International was working heavily to provide evidence about the, the massacres and the ongoing um, genocide. And the, in this case, um, the United States Department of State worked heavily to try to undermine the, 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 the legitimacy of, 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 that, uh, of that report. Um, and and, and with, with clear uh, uh, understanding that there were uh, no question um, uh, violations of human rights and, and who are the sort of the stakeholders involved, Guatemalan press and a number of different things um, that overall in general uh, sort of leave us with uh, a troublesome reality, no? a, a reality that asks us to, to consider um, what, um, why did we do this, right? Why, why would, um, any country, why, let alone the United States, uh, create the context, protect perpetrators of, of, of genocide. And, and this is uh, uh, one of the, the sort of, the, really the heart of the matter. Um, and, and as I mentioned, part of our, of our, of our discussion today will, will involve our, along the lines of um, what were the impacts of the narrative that was created? Uh, what was the, um, uh, sort of uh, concern uh, uh, about the, the the capacity for us to understand um, the reality of the event. Let's go back to the to the presentation for a moment, if I may. And hopefully, this is working right. I do apologize for any sort of um, technical difficulties. You're good. And so, uh, again, as we were talking about genocide, is there's a specific definition, right? What is genocide? Is the attempt to remove every single member of a group uh, uh, from the face of the earth, and 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 what that group is, it it varies. The the, the initial genocide convention talked about uh, political, race, religion. Over time, that has expanded to include other groups, even political. Um, uh, political affiliation that were initially not concerned. And, and part of the question is that, that we've had for as long as there's been genocide is why do people do this, right? Um, and a number of, of theories have been uh, all, uh, very popular, uh, sort of the, there's a, in the case, for example, of the, the Holocaust, that it was the, the, the Nazi ideology that was to blame, right? Um, or uh, in, in other cases as well, the, the capacity of, of um, or the power of governments to, to um, maybe brainwash the population at all, um, or blind obedience to authority, right? Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the Nazi military that were brought to trial will make the argument I was simply following orders, right? So these are attempts to explain why uh, this, the, the genocide in Guatemala presents a, a unique case for us to consider this because uh, it, it brings us into question that the, the Cold War itself created the context for, um, for the violence, right? Um, as defined, globally and, and locally in Guatemala. So in political science, we have this one term, real politic, polit, you know, po politic with a K, that refers to the idea that um, a lot of times governments and, and, uh, and, and leaders of governments have decisions to make in terms of, of policy decisions that are going to be based on practical benefits rather than on what is right and wrong. And, and so in this relationship between um, a man who was, uh, as you see in the picture here, uh, Efrain Rios Montt was charged with genocide eventually, and he was found guilty of genocide, which was unique. It was the first time that a head of state 
had been not only charged, but found guilty of genocide in a court of law. Um, but during the time that he was in office, he, he, he had a very strong and, and, and uh, um, for lack of a better word, positive relationship with, with the US and particularly with the um, Reagan administration. And, and part of what was in it for the US national interest was not the promotion of genocide, uh, but ultimately the, 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 the main interest was that Rios Mont and any other uh, of the, the, the perpetrators of genocide in Guatemala throughout the years could promise to the United States that they would not join the Soviet bloc. And so that was our, uh, our ultimate involvement when it comes to the national interests of the United States within that particular country. And, and so therefore the event itself became politicized, became a yet another one of the sort of fallen dominoes that um, for the, the leaders of Guatemala, uh, surely racism, long standing uh, views on um, a relationship between the indigenous populations of Guatemala and Guatemala as a whole uh, played a significant role. And surely the, the desire to maintain power of people like um, Rios Montt also uh, where uh, allow us to have a better understanding as to why the event happened the way that it did. Um, but as I mentioned, the connection within a larger geopolitical reality uh, had a number of impacts. The first is, is that it created the context for an increase of violence, to increase use of violence against the, um, the indigenous majors, because it justified the, the, the violence against what they're perceived to be anti-government forces or, or even alleged supporters or uh, communists. So the, the, the justification came from the, the, the larger conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And of course, then for as you saw evidence, and again, anyone is interested, you can, in, in, in looking at the whole uh, package of documents that were declassified, you can simply do a Google uh, search, uh, put Guatemala genocide declassified CIA, and, and you see a number of different, um, different accesses. There is no question, that the United States was aware uh, of the level of, of the, the violence uh, growing into a genocide, but nonetheless, we continue to support them. And what's interesting about this is that this, is, this was not just a Ronald Reagan uh, reality. This were, there were precedents from both the uh, Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. So the, the consistency was what was it that Guatemala presented to us within the larger context? And so therefore we worked, uh, sadly enough, uh, as an American, it, it troubles me deeply that we worked heavily in creating a, uh, a false narrative of the event that um, had the significant consequences of ex expanding the level of violence, perpetuating the genocide, and making it harder to hold um, uh, perpetrators accountable, which in and of itself, all of that I'm talking about uh, were a form of a violation of our promise to never again uh, allow genocide to occur. And um, for, for the sake of clarification, if I didn't, um, um, didn't make it kind of clear earlier, we're talking about this region of the world. And you can see in this, um, picture on the right, that when we're talking about Mayan uh, people, we're not, it's not really a single group. There's multitude of different ling ethno-linguistic groups that um, uh, cover the, the larger percentage of, of, of Guatemala. It's one of the countries that has the, the largest percentage of indigenous people in the world. And I, I wanted to, to take a moment and, and, and have us con con consider um, this picture, uh, this is a picture from the Holocaust. This is not from Guatemala. This is, I don't remember the city, but um, what you see here is a number of Jewish men being forced to scrub the floor. 
And what I want you to pay attention to is the faces in the crowds, not so much the faces of the uh, um, the SS officers, um, but the faces of regular people. Um, there's this face, there's that face, and there's that face, and you can get a sense um, of something happening, right? Um, it, it has to, it didn't escape them, the, the audience, the reality of what was happening, right? The, uh, the, 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 the deliberate uh, embarrassment and, and, and forced um, scrubbing of the floor by, by men. Uh, and it's an awkward moment. It's got to be an awkward moment because members in the audience gain their, um, you know, a sense of how they should act based on the people around them. So in all the years that we've had this Holocaust Memorial talks, we've always used the term a bystander. Uh, and a bystander and the phenomenon itself is that when people see a wrong, um, of some type. If you're a member of a group, there's this very human phenomenon that happens that since you're part of a group, you're less likely to, to do some, to try to do something if nobody else is doing because there's a diffusion of responsibility. Um, this person was not the only one who saw this and who had uh, an opportunity to do something about it. There were all these other people. So there's this phenomenon in which responsibility to end a wrong is diluted uh, uh, in a group. And, and there's also the, the sort of um, a certain amount of deliberate ignorance that is created here because they are getting their, their clues as to how to act from the people who are forcing the, the, the Jewish man to scrub the floor. So, and that also happens in group. And I'm asking you to consider this, of course, at an individual level. But all genocides allow us to consider this question that I'm going to have for you. Uh, surely the, the Guatemalan genocide does. And that is, um, in addition to individuals who deny reality, in addition to individuals who become bystanders, can nations also act uh, in, in, uh, as bystanders when we're seeing uh, extreme force, forms of violence, in this case, genocide? Can nations also engage in denial? And, and uh, at least for the, this latter question, don't take my word for it. I showed you evidence in, in, uh, in, in some of the declassified US uh, and CIA documents that leave no question that the US acted deliberately on purpose to deny the reality of the violence and the level of genocide in Guatemala. Uh, and and all, then the question becomes, you know, why, of course, and, and we talked a little bit about that, very complex answer. Uh, but this is um, one of the, the, the central concern, co concerns that, that we have when we're, consider, when we're talking about genocide. You know, why is it? That, that people behave this way uh, towards one another and, and what, um, what, if any, um, are the consequences for failure to act. Uh, as, I, as I talked uh, earlier, um, uh, there are um, some troublesome considerations and I wonder, um, I wonder what you all um, uh, think about this. Uh, again, if nothing else, this, I hope that this talk that, um, that I gave at least introduced you to another um, uh, incident of a genocide that has not been publicized or that has remained silent to some degree. And these are also questions as a political scientist, I always tell this to my students, that these are also questions about um, the role of government in, in our life and our role in government, right? Um, none of us were involved in this decision, but in some ways in, in a country like ours, in, in American democracy, this is rule of the people, by the people. So our government's behavior should reflect ours. 
uh, goals and, and desires. And um, maybe for the sake of time, uh, I will stop there and, and see if there are uh, any questions uh, from the audience uh, or comments from the audience. And it, it, again, thank you for your time. I, I will uh, once again, take a moment to uh, encourage uh, those of you that are watching this to um, at least consider it uh, visit, uh, attending the last of our uh, survivors talk that, that we have coming up later today. It's an amazing opportunity that, that we should not let um, let go to waste. Thank you for your time. Hey, yo. Um, okay, I am looking in the chat box and not, uh, uh, Dr. Balsonado, I'm uh, not looking, seeing any questions at this point in time. Um, uh, I had, do have a question uh, about the uh, picture that you showed of the, um, if, it's okay, is it okay if I ask a question? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, uh, the picture you showed of the uh, SS watching the Jewish man uh, scrub the floor and a crowd behind him. Uh, and I agree, it's a herd mentality. If it's okay with everyone else, it's okay with, with us. But also, isn't there an aspect of fear there because Again, if someone did say, uh, don't do that to these people, they could face who knows. Uh, so it's a, I think, it's a, it, it, would you agree, it's kind of a combination of, of the herd mentality and also fear of what will happen? Yeah, for sure. Whenever we are talking uh, and considering the behavior of bystanders to extreme forms of violence like the Holocaust or, or any other genocide, we have to consider um, what could be the consequences to act for the individual. Um, because clearly um, in, in both the Holocaust and in, in the Guatemalan genocide, if somebody tried to act as an, as an um, they, they could easily face the same level of violence. Or, or that's a know. consideration that's a yeah. consideration but there are also a, a lot of um, historical uh, 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 evidence that even in the face of significant consequences people do act right yeah. so it's not a, a, a complete impediment is I, I guess what I would answer um, okay. but surely okay. yeah um, in, in some cases that can be enough to uh, to stop people from uh, stopping a wrong, which is part of the purpose, right? Part mm -hmm. of the purpose of the violence and part of the purpose of political violence is to deliver a message, right? And, and in the case of genocide, for sure, in the case of extreme forms of violence of massacre, the, the message is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This could be you next, right? But, and we're seeing defiance right now as we speak mm -hmm. over in, in Europe. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And um, we are at an interesting time in, in that we are in, in looking in, in, in our real as expression good in real time, we're seeing um, violations of human rights um, playing in the news nonstop, multiple times a day. Um, and at an individual level, I think it's important for each of us to, to ask is there something I can do? And of course it would be impossible for us, an individual like you or me, or any of us to, to stop a war of that magnitude, right? But there are things we can do, right? And then the question also becomes, what should governments do about this war in Ukraine and about the, the ongoing uh, growing as well, uh, evidence of deliberate targeting of civilians and deliberate targeting of infrastructure like schools and, and hospitals and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, do countries have a duty to act, right? Uh, and that's an important consideration. Exactly. And um, even if the, if the country is not part of EU and not part of NATO, 
do we have a an ethical duty to act? Right. Yeah. And and I am I'm, I'm optimistic, but clearly, if we if we go back and look at the Guatemalan case, I I think that everyone can clearly see that we failed to act. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and that is one of our shortcomings that uh, to to this day leave me upset as an American, right? That we didn't do something about it. Yeah, and it's interesting that you brought up the United Fruit. Uh, that's our, those are bananas coming in, everyone. Right. Um, because Guatemala is a banana republic, air quote, air quote. Right. And so it's interesting that United Fruit said, oh, I'm not seeing anything. Right. Not only that, when I first saw that document that um, on paper to U.S. American corporations, uh, the, the United Fruit and and that electrical company said to the CIA, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do whatever you need to, to get to, to carry out a, a, a violent uh, overthrow of a democratic government, use our facilities, use our personnel, people that we, that we have on, on payroll, you can count on them as assets. That blew my mind. Uh, it, it, and I guess that's what I would. Yeah, and of course we always have the question, was it, was it for their best interest or for the best interest of the of the individuals in Guatemala, of course. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Dr. Bocchinago. Um, uh, and uh, I, again, I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and, but thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, I've been to Guatemala. And, uh, oh, 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 we have a question. Uh, all right, uh, and, and this is coming from Sarah. Uh, and uh, her question is, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry, it's coming from Ashford, okay, I know Ashford. Uh, in what ways is the Guatemalan genocide similar to the Holocaust? That's a good question. Um, it, it was, so there's some similarity of it, and one of them is that both in, in Germany and in Guatemala, a strong sense of a particular type of nationalism played a role in, 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 in the violence. Um, the, there's also uh, a similarity, and, and by that I mean uh, sort of a destructive nationalism that defines what it means to be Guatemalan and only this way, what it means to be German only this way, right? Um, and, and, and so that's, that itself, uh, creates an us between them, right? And, and makes it pretty clear who is the, the target for violence. Um, similar to the Holocaust in Guatemala, there was also a, 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 a significant, not as big, uh, but a machinery of death. In Guatemala, there were, uh, as you saw, some types of concentration camps. Uh, and, and so, and, and as in Guatemala, there were also, as, in, as in, in, in the Holocaust, there was also the use of the military as a tool of the genocide. So those are similarities as well. Um, the uh, scapegoating that we saw in, in, in the Holocaust of uh, blaming the Jews for everything that was wrong in Germany um, also happened in Guatemala. The, the uh, uh, the Indians, as they were called, were blamed for everything that was wrong, right? And also the same thing with any uh, sort of opposition to the government. So that's uh, a third similarity between the two conflicts. Um, and uh, I would say that at the sort of at the beginning of the Holocaust, Similar to uh, what it was in Guatemala, there was a certain amount of bystander behavior of nations around the world. Um, I think a number of, of, of you should be familiar with uh, a number of troublesome realities about uh, Jewish refugees trying to flee Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied zones only to be sent back uh, because of a number of different political considerations. So similarly, again, and I think that will be the last one that I can think of and highlight, there, there, there was a certain amount of lack of action 
in both the Holocaust and the genocide uh, to prevent the victimization of, of, of people who were scapegoated. Hopefully that answers that question. Exactly, exactly. And um, I've been to Guatemala and the Mayans are such peaceful people. Mm -hmm. They're very, they're very um, mellow. They, they follow very strict traditions. Uh, so it's a shame. I mean, it's a shame. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. Any? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you've gotten any more. Um, okay, uh, again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation on Guatemala. Uh, and uh, if any of you have not been there, it is a beautiful country. Um, and uh, again, as I say, the, the Mayans are uh, a very interesting culture, very peaceful, uh, very strict traditionalist as far as their culture. Uh, so, um, and again, we come back to the uh, ethical aspect of uh, what should what should all of us have, or what should have been done? Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and um, again, uh, this evening uh, we have a survivor talk uh, at six p.m. Correct, Sarah? Yes, six p.m. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Steen Met speaking tonight. Oh, wonder and Steen is such a, a wonderful individual, and I've heard his uh, talks before, uh, and your. Um, uh, very uh, up, upbeat, but very um, uh, scheme takes you to the scene at the time. So anyway, thank you everyone uh, and, and thanks for your time. Um, may I put a plug in for me? <laughs> Sorry, gotcha, gotcha. Um, uh, hi, uh, I will be doing a um, uh, a YouTube live on the Herodomor, uh, which is the genocide of 4 million uh, Ukrainians in 1932 and 1933. That will be tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, and uh, so please, uh, it is uh, another uh, aspect of genocide, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, promulgated by Stalin. So uh, we'll take a look at that tomorrow. So if you have an opportunity, uh, it will be via Zoom. It's in your events calendar. It's also in our Holocaust Memorial event. Uh, but please, to, to see me at six, uh, please come to see Steve. Uh, Matt, she is a, a great speaker and he uh, uh, will visually take you back to uh, the time uh, in a very upbeat uh, fashion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bolsonaro, for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for presenting today. We look forward to seeing everyone tonight and tomorrow for our panels.